It's our pleasure to welcome everyone to this uh, acquisition seminar. Uh, we are privileged to have uh, the CEO and president of Huntington Ingalls Industries, uh, Mike Petters. Uh, he's a graduate of the United States Naval Academy. He's a submariner, uh, and he has his MBA from the College of William and Mary. He's worked in the industry for over 35 years, so uh, he brings with him an incredible wealth of experience. Sir, we're really glad to have you with us today. Uh, and moderating this discussion, uh, we are privileged to have Vice Admiral David Lewis, currently the Director of the Naval Warfare Studies Institute, as well as leading the Acquisition Research Program at the Naval Postgraduate School. Uh, he, uh, again, a career officer in the Navy with an incredible uh, education from a Bachelor of Science in Computer Science at the University of Nebraska, uh, and also graduated from the Naval Postgraduate School with a Master of Science in Computer Science. And so it is our privilege to have them uh, here today. Again, the ground rules uh, for this, uh, as you have questions, please include them in the chat. Uh, we will moderate those questions and, and start that dialogue uh, at about 12.30. Uh, Vice Admiral Lewis will begin the questioning uh, and dialogue with uh, Mr. Petters. Uh, and so we look forward to this uh, discussion. And with that, over to you, Admiral Lewis. Well, thank you, uh, Mike, for agreeing to, to spend some time with us uh, today. Uh, I know you got a lot of responsibilities running a uh, a uh, very large defense company, but I, so I do appreciate that you've uh, taken some time to, to uh, visit with us and share your thoughts. Um, I thought I'd jump right into it. Uh, the number one issue obviously facing industry these days is COVID. Uh, before I retired, uh, I was a director of DCMA, Defense Contract Management Agency, and my last four months uh, in the Navy and as, uh, as director, was dealing with this new thing called COVID and uh, industry shutting down, companies shutting down, uh, uh, production lines uh, trying to restructure themselves in order to have distance between workers and, and supply chains that suddenly uh, went empty. Um, and this was all new to us at the time. And so we're literally making it up as we go along. Uh, two or three phone call meeting, long meetings on phones. The Zoom hadn't been invented yet. Uh, trying to figure out what's going on and how, how to deal with it. And, and I would say I was, I was impressed with the alacrity and flexibility of industry to respond to this emerging crisis. There were no vaccines. Uh, the rules were still, uh, we didn't know what they were exactly. And yet hundreds of companies that I saw were restructuring their production lines, uh, changing how they dealt with suppliers. Uh, and, uh, and as I left the Navy and as I left that job, I, I frankly was impressed with uh, with industry's response. So fast forward now to 18 months later, uh, I'm curious to see uh, how the picture looks today. It's not new anymore. You've been doing it now for almost two years, I guess. And uh, have you, you know, what have you seen change over the last couple of years? And, and what kind of are the big lessons that you've learned out of uh, this uh, COVID experience we've had uh, uh, in the last, since, well, since 2019? Well, thanks, Dave. And, uh, and I remember those early days when uh, we were actually uh, trying to figure out how to do virtual meetings or, and, and, and you were in the Pentagon and, uh, or sometimes you were virtual and we were virtual and we were trying to walk our way through the just the the uh, the challenges that we had, and I mean, every day we had new stuff that was revealing itself to us that we had to go really figure out policy for. You know that, um, and and I would uh, for this audience, I would say that that there's a there was a lesson that had to be relearned on our part, um, and that is uh, uh, the question is never if it's when. You know, the, the, um, the, we 
we were basically, I would characterize our, at least at HII, I can't say this is true of everybody in the industry, but at HII, we were, we were aware that the virus was out there. We knew that it was kind of doing some things. Um, but it wasn't until the NBA secured their season when they got, when they got one case, they secured their season. And that night, that was a Wednesday night. It was uh, March the 11th, I believe. Um, I was in Pascagoula, and uh, uh, that night I spent kind of going through the how do we get the whole leadership team to move away from this? What are we going to do if it happens to what are we going to do when it happens? And, you know, and the next morning I was in the shipyard and talking to the president and the leadership there. And we were talking about um, this is going to happen to us. What are we going to do? Uh, what do we need to do? You know, it's interesting how companies see things. Um, you know, I saw it uh, and it hit me like a hammer over the head, uh, you know, being the being the dim bulb in the box. Um, I caught it by watching the NBA game get canceled. Um, my chief financial officer, who's now our chief operating officer, uh, he saw something entirely different. He called me that Thursday morning as I was on my way into the shipyard and he said, I think we need to set up the crisis management team. And I said, Chris, I was going to call you and tell you that. And he said, well, I said, why are you saying that? Is it the basketball game? And he said, no. He said, Boeing just drew down all their cash from all their revolvers. I mean, and, and, and so, you know, you, 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 everybody, everybody has a lens and everybody's kind of looking through their lens. But when a company like Boeing goes and draws down all of their revolvers to build up a cash pile, uh, that means that they're expecting something really bad to come. And, and my finance team basically said, we don't know what it is, but we need to get to get our acts together here because whatever it is, it's going to be bad. And so, uh, and so a day later, we, I was back in Newport News. We set up the crisis management team. We met through the weekend. We basically met every day for about, I'd say about the first three weeks we were meeting every day and we were, you know, quickly realizing we needed to make some pretty fundamental decisions that would guide everybody. The first one was, uh, we're going to stay open. We, we are not going to close. We Because if we ever close, we'll never meet the conditions to reopen again. And so we have to stay open. It helped that the Pentagon came out and had and designated the industry as uh, essential. But the from the very beginning, our commitment was we're going to stay open. And that gave that that took a whole conversation off the table, you know that that people wanted to have. People were suggesting we shut down for two weeks, or do this or do that. And my answer was, which two weeks do you want me to go? And what are the conditions for me coming back if I ever go out? And so we're just not going to consider those things. So if you can eliminate a whole part of the field that you don't have to worry about because you're going to stay open, and you and you go after that with real conviction, now we're going to stay open. That means we're gonna stay open when we have positive cases in the workforce. How are we gonna do that? What are the policies that we need? And so we created a lot of flexibility uh, for our workforce. We, we basically said, we don't want you to come to work if you're sick. And so we removed any sort of financial penalties that they would have. Um, and backstopping all of this, Dave, I know you were, you were actually part of this decision, was the, the um, decision on the Pentagon's part to change the progress payment rates, yep. right? to keep the cash flowing because we can't do any of that if the cash gets restricted. So having the Pentagon back us with, we're gonna keep the cash flowing, your commitment has to be, you gotta stay open, but you also gotta flow the cash to your suppliers. Um, those were critical decisions in the first week. And for all of the rest of the things that we did after that, uh, you know, the, 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 um, the leadership in the building, the leadership in the industry, there was a lot of trust there that we were we had each other's backs on this and that we were going to fight our way through it. So, um, and and you know, so what's happened since then? Uh, you know, the biggest thing was at the very beginning the, the schools closed, and uh, and our employees had to make choices over whether they come to work or take care of their kids. Uh, you know, my view and kind of back to the conviction of we're going to stay open. Um, my view was. I really want to hang on to the employees that would choose their kids over me. Those are the people I want working in this company. So we have to make it easy for them to do that. And we did. Um, 
at you know at some shareholder expense. I mean, in the when the uh, when the first when we had our earnings call in the second quarter, which would have been August, uh, we took a we took a pretty substantial charge against earnings to cover these costs. And um, when the shareholders came to me and asked me, "What the heck are you guys doing?" My answer was. I'm doing what's best for our employees because our employees are going to be the ones that solve all the problems in the future. So, you know, there was a little bit of the usual flagellation, but I did okay on that. I got through it. All right. Um, and I wouldn't, I don't regret any of that. And, you know, time has proven that that was the right strategy. We, we were, we played that right. The team executed it well. Uh, and now we're coming up on uh, getting close to two years since we did all that. Um, we, we are, I mean, tactically right now, we have five times as many cases this week as we had in the middle of December due to the Omicron uh, surge. But I think that at the same time, our teams know how to deal with that. We've, we've put lots of different mechanisms in place to track people and work uh, and make sure we're working the stuff that's most important. Um, and, uh, and so it, we're, you know, we're not, uh, I won't say it's running like it was in 2019, but I would say that, uh, and, and I will say that we, we, um, we're managing right now. We're managing right now. There's going to be an, op we're, we're trying to manage it so that we accelerate out of this, whatever, whatever the new look is at the end, whenever you just say this is over, we want to be running when we hit that gate. Oh, well, that's good. I, I had actually forgotten about uh, the uh, staying open a uh, bit, but you're, but you're right. That was, that was a real moment of industry and government collaboration because you're right. The states were all shutting things down. And, uh, and, uh, and I remember uh, Ms. Lord, uh, Ellen Lord was, uh, was calling up governors and calling up congressional representatives advocating for companies uh, like you to, you know, okay, we need to work to keep them open. And uh, you know, my commitment to uh, companies as DCMA was if you're open, we're open. And, right. Uh, well, uh, you know, and there was a lot of hysteria out there, Dave. I mean, was, you know, we, had, we had curfews put in place where yeah. policemen were stopping our employees on the way to work. I remember that. They weren't supposed to be out there. <laughs> um, you know, I, I got, uh, this is something that you don't ever really want to have happen to you, but my, my home address and phone number got posted on Facebook in, a, in, a, in one of the rants that shows up on Facebook. And, oh. um, you know, so of course you got, we, we have ways to clean all that up, but, you know, it's just, it, it was a very, it was a very stressful, sobering month. And uh, um, we had employees who basically, I mean, they'd been convinced that uh, if they got this thing, they were going to die. Uh, and that we were, you know, the fact that we were staying open meant that we were, we were advocating that they die, you know, which was, that's a terrible place for a leader to be, right? So, so we had to work our way all the way through that. And, uh, and we got through it. We got through it great. And uh, not without bruises, not without lessons learned, but, uh, but here we are. So I, I think that uh, kind of illustrates that uh, top level industrial management that we probably need to do more of. It's a good uh, case uh, as we, you know, we tend to manage each program and each company individually in, in that case for that uh, six, eight week period till we sorted out what the rules were. I think uh, we together, the government and industry were managing the industry as a whole, and uh, and finding out things like policemen were stopping, uh, I had employees that were stopped. So so we wrote letters uh, signed by uh, senior defense officials saying this person is a critical defense worker, and is allowed to uh, to be traveling and is allowed to be on the road. I carried those letters with me, and uh, and it's interesting. I remember conversations with my grandparents about that in World War II. If you're a defense worker, you got special gas coupons and you could get more butter and and uh, so we used to do that and uh, so we reinvented that particular wheel uh, do you see any I really like your comments about take care of the workforce that's that is uh, something that sometimes gets lost in the accounting um, do you have any do you think there's going to be long-term changes in, in how you do business as a result of this uh, once once we're through this which 
I presume we will get through. Uh, well, that, I mean, that's day we could have a whole day long seminar on the workforce right now. Um, you know, I think I think the pandemic has accelerated some pretty what I'd say were manageable long term trends that they've accelerated accelerated them in a way and made some made made a bit of a crisis out of it. Um, the the percentage of people in the country today that want to work is lower than it's been in decades. Uh, you know, the pandemic accelerated uh, a lot of retirements uh, from my workforce. Uh, you know, uh, from they call it the baby boomer retirement. You're, you're hearing the uh, the talking heads on TV call it the great resignation. I mean, there's a lot of retirements out there. There's also a uh, there's been a recalibration of where does work fit into my life. If you if you are an employee, back in back in my my days on the waterfront, um, you know Monday or Tuesday I come to work Monday morning, and by Monday afternoon my foremen were talking to me about who was going to get overtime for the weekend, which was actually pretty cool because I could say you know what if your team is this far along on Friday you can have overtime on Saturday, um, because they they were they wanted it they wanted it. Um, an interesting thing has happened here in the last two years is that people will show up for work, but when you start trying to gather the team for to continue work through the weekend, uh, we're having trouble filling some of that some, you know, and and I think that uh, you know the pandemic has has actually given people a chance to kind of recalibrate their lives and say, you know, this balance thing, I got to get a little bit more balanced here than I've had before. That's probably going to change the way that we hire. It's going to change the number of people that we hire, the types of people that we hire, um, and uh, you know. So we're so if we can get higher levels of engagement from fewer hours a week, that's probably a good thing for us, right? Uh, if we have if we are actually seeing lower levels of engagement resulting in lower hours per week, then that's a bad thing for us. And so that's kind of the way we're working our way through it. Um, the other part of it is that uh, there's a, you don't ever hear a lot about this, but about one third of the population chooses not to work. Yeah. And, and so when you see an unemployment rate of three, four, five percent, you're really only looking at the percentage of people that want to work. Oh, good point. Good point. Right. So, so if one third of the population is not working and three percent of the people that want to work are not working, well, how do you fix that? Well, you try to get skills and, you know, we try to do skill training and that sort of thing, but boy, we could really benefit if we could change that one third to maybe 30% instead of 33 and maybe 28%. If we could kind of carve in and maybe that's convincing people to come back to work, which I think is the long, that's the long putt. Uh -huh. uh, maybe it's the, we change what work is, right? And we've, we're, what we're doing today I can tell you 24 months ago, this was not part of our experience in my company. Okay. Wow. Um, wow. Now, it is absolutely central to how we run the business today. Um, so maybe we change the way we think about work and we change the, um, you know, kind of the geography, a, a, simple, a simple story. Uh, when I got involved in Pascagoula, Dave, uh, you were, I think around that around that bit, part of the business at that time, and Governor Barber came and asked me if I was going to close that shipyard because we were post Katrina, we had lots of issues, and and I said, you know, Governor, uh, I am in this company. We have work for forty thousand people. I don't have forty thousand people in Pascagoula. I don't have forty thousand people in Newport News. So I need to figure out how to make Pascagoula function again. Yeah. Well, I think you know. There's nothing today that says Pascagoula couldn't have 40,000 people because they don't all have to be in Pascagoula anymore, right? Good and point. so I think, there's, I think that there's going to be some of that that, that, that affects the way we think about work uh, going forward, too. Okay. Uh, I was going to ask this question later, but I'll jump to it since we're talking about workforce. Uh, and that's the topic of STEM. Um, so you know, the shipbuilding industry, uh, in my experience, is... Uh, it's hot, dirty, hard work, a lot of it. Uh, and that's always a challenge. Uh, you, you, the industry as a whole has had a challenge 
getting people to come to work and then frankly staying at work uh, given the nature of, of heavy industrial work and uh, and I know you've been a proponent of STEM education uh, uh, with the company for a long time. Uh, I've been to a couple of your presentations and I've seen uh, some of your material on it. I talked to a lot of your workers about it. I was involved in Pascagoula with some of the apprenticeship programs. So I'm familiar with that work down there. And that's, I mean, to me, that's, uh, that's world-class uh, kind of work that I saw at the time uh, when I was there. And, uh, uh, you know, given your comments about the change in nature of work now and, and the change in perception of employees, do you, how do you see your STEM programs either changing or expanding or, uh, or uh, uh, are you seeing results from the work that you've already done over the last, uh, frankly, couple of decades, I think, uh, in, in that area? Well, there's a, I mean, a lot in that, Dave, but I, I'd say the first First piece is that uh, where we are, where we can have discrete uh, action that will lead to measurable results, we actually do that pretty well. And you mentioned the apprentice programs. Uh, you know, the, the beauty of the apprenticeships uh, are, in fact, the, the the second part of that conversation I was having with Governor Barber was, you know, I don't have forty thousand people in Newport News or Pascagoula, and he turned to me and says, "Well, what do you need me to do?" And I said, "Build me an apprentice school," and and he. Then go into Pascagoula. For those of you who've been there, you drive by, you're going to drive by the uh, Haley Reeves Barber Maritime Training Academy. You know, it's amazing how these things kind of work. And um, but where we're able to do that and be very and, and people that go through our apprentice program, they're past the issue of this is hard work and it's dirty and it's hot. They've already figured that out and they're in it anyway. Right. So um, we have done some recruiting in our community college systems, kind of like the Marines to say this is hard work. If you if you measure up, we'd love to have you. Right. And so we've done some of that. Um, and, and that has worked very well. One of the things we had to get at um, back 15 years ago, I think we've done, we've completely obliterated this problem now, but, but 15 to 20 years ago, the problem we had was that folks that wanted to come to work for us were usually third or fourth quartile high school graduates. And, and you would go sit in the classes and you would hear the teachers say things like, you know, uh, you need to pass my class or else you're gonna end up working in the shipyard. And so one of the things, and you know, and Dave, you know that's true. And and uh, one of the things that we did was we started a summer program. We did. I can't take credit for this. Actually, this was done at Avondale, and we plagiarized the daylights out of it. Um, we started a summer program where we brought teachers in and let them work in the shipyard for about six weeks, and they enjoyed the extra money. But they also got in. They got some insight into. Hey, this business is not an old line manufacturing business. This is a high technology, solid way to make a living and contribute to something bigger than yourself. And the, the, literally within a couple of years, the framing went from third, fourth quartile high school students to second and even some first quartile high school students want to come to work. Excellent. And, and, it be, and, and the teachers, frankly, part of the problem, some of the teachers wanted to come work for us too. And we had to kind of be careful with that but but you know it's a lot different if you're if you're 16 years old and 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 the leader in the classroom says you need to do this or else you'll go there and two years later the 16 year old sitting in the classroom and the teacher says if you want to go there you have to do this and and that's just a completely changing the frame of reference there right and so we we've done those things um I go back to kind of, go, let's go be more strategic. Uh, you guys, Navy puts out a report every year that talks about the state of recruiting. Um, and I first heard this about 10 years ago. Um, I was at the War College and I heard the secretary, Secretary Mavis, make a comment. He said, you take the population between the ages of 18 and 25 today, and you take out the people that have a criminal record, you take out the people that have not graduated from high school, and you take out the people that have some sort of physical like obesity or some sort of physical limitation, I'm left with only being able to recruit from 25% of that population. I'm a CEO, I'm sitting in the audience and I said, and those are the people I want too. And, and so you see the problem is, the problem we have as a nation, and I get on my soapbox here a little bit, a lot, frankly, if we could, if we could beat the Russians at 25%, 
And if we could change that 25% to 30%, mm -hmm. Chinese wouldn't have a chance. Okay. Wouldn't have a chance. And so we as a company are investing in that whole pipeline from pre-kindergarten all the way through the various programs to post-secondary, trying to find, trying to create access for people who would not otherwise have access so that they can become part of the vanguard that is above 25%, you know, that extra margin that we need. You know, that's the way we're going after it. That's excellent. That's excellent. Uh, you're right. There's plenty of work. There's no lack of work out there uh, uh, for for you and, and frankly across the defense industrial base. So uh, uh, that's uh, that's good to hear. Um, you are uniquely privileged in that you really touch the entire spectrum of Navy shipbuilding. I mean, literally from top end nuclear submarines, ballistic missile submarines. Uh, all the way uh, down uh, to, uh, not down, but all the way through to a conventional amphibious force and, and literally everything in between, combatants, carriers, the whole nine yards. So you, you know, other companies have, you know, uh, slices of that. You're really the only one that sees the whole spectrum across all of that. Uh, any any thoughts you'd like to share about that? Uh, uh, not throw. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, let me let me say, I, I'm not a nuke, but I I have come to learn and appreciate. Uh, the goodness in a lot of nuclear community practices. You know, they have a high consequence of failure, low risk tolerance approach to things. And, uh, and frankly, in the service Navy, there are things that we do sometimes where we could, we could use that. And I brought that, I learned about that, and then I brought it to my job. So when I'm handling ammunition, uh, or when I was handling ammunition, I approach things in a very nuclear way. Uh, and, uh, but uh, on the other hand, you don't always have to have that for every little thing you do. Uh, you know, just because I have a calibrated torque wrench doesn't mean I need to always use the calibrated torque wrench if, if we follow what I'm saying. So, yeah. so I was, I was uh, aware of the capability and then I used it strategically. So, there, so that's kind of what I'm looking at. Uh, uh, I wanna flavor my question in that way. So, uh, so do you see particularly good practices that maybe should be used a little more? Uh, let me start in a positive way. Yeah, so, uh, you know, the, the kind of the, the kind of uh, uh, smart alecky answer to the question, <laughs> Dave, is how many navies do you think there are? Right. And, uh, but no, I, I mean, <laughs> there's a few, yes, there's a few. That's right. That's right. And, and they all have, uh, they actually play to their strengths, yeah. you know, and, and I think that um, we can, we can sit around and say that, boy, it'd be great if we had one size fits all. But the reality is, as you pointed out, we don't really need to have one size fits all. Uh, when I was president of Newport News, a nuclear shipyard, uh, I made the statement in a staff meeting one morning, and it, it goes like this. Uh, you show me a baseball team where every runner is safe at home, and I will show you a baseball team that's not scoring as many runs as it should. Well, nuclear shipyard, nuclear leaders in that shipyard, I got an earful after that staff meeting from, from people basically saying, yeah, but Mike, you, you, you must miss something here. You must not understand you know how important the work is and the and the consequence of failure and the and the, and the likelihood of failure and all of that sort of thing i said no i get it completely i said and there's parts of this business where every single freaking runner had better be safe yeah. but we've got 150 departments i don't have to run all 150 departments like that okay. you know i don't need to have that become the the least common denominator approach to leadership inside of Newport New Shipbuilding because that's actually the arthritis that, that we were trying to get out of the system. Um, you know, one of the things that I saw, you know, I was interviewed by Rick over twice. Uh, and, and so I have that, uh, one of the last ones to interview with him actually. But uh, so I got the full, I got the full uh, treatment on the nuclear side. So I really have a good understanding of how that works. Um, and here's, here's what I would say is the biggest difference. Um, not good or bad, it's a difference. 
if there's an issue, if there's a technical issue or a programmatic issue of some kind on a nuclear program, all of the people that have an interest or a say or a vote convene in a way that um, only, only naval reactors can get everybody in the room. And nobody leaves that room until there is a path ahead. And inside the room, the, uh, the communication is authentic. Mm -hmm. as the best way I can put it, is if you have a view, you had better express it because when we open the door and we go back out, we are all going to be on the same sheet of music. But inside the room, it is messy, you know, and your elbows are going to get uh, twisted and you're, and you had better be, you better have the backbone to stand up for what you believe in there. Um, when I started getting involved with the non-nuclear Navy, one of my first frustrations was I never saw that meeting take place on the non-nuclear side of the Navy. Interesting. Interesting. You know, because yeah. there's, a, there's a whole lot of people that have got, they've got votes, you know, what kind of radar are we going to put on the ship and what kind of, what kind of coding are we going to do? And what about that bulkhead? And they all have votes and there's not really somebody that, that has the, has the, the stick to get everybody in the room. Good point. It's a good point. But then I started thinking about that, Dave, and I started thinking, but you know, they don't need to do that because the consequences are different. Yeah. You know, the risk yeah. algorithm is different. Um, you can actually build a non-nuclear ship and then go back and reverse engineer the, the solution. You can do that. Yeah. You know, you can, you can go down there and you put an engineer on the deck plate and say, you know what, I got to connect this pipe to, through that bulkhead to the pipe on the other side. How do I do it? And the, and the engineer and the mechanic can kind of work for a little bit and they come up with something. And then the engineer will go back and say, okay, I'm gonna go draw it and test it and make sure it works, Well, we can do that. You ain't ever doing that on a nuclear ship. Not ever, right? That's true. That's on a nuclear true. ship, you would come up with like three or four or five proposals. Yeah. You would try a couple, you'd throw them away and then you'd finally get the one you wanted. Yeah. Well, and you know what? You need to do that because the consequence is so high. Yeah. Yeah. You don't need to do that on the, on the non-nuclear ship. And so, okay, so the program has evolved differently. And I think it, you know, my, my uh, insight was, boy, it'd be nice if we could do it all that way, but the reality is we can't afford to do it all that way. Yeah. And, and more importantly, because, you know, the argument can be that if you do it right, it's, it's going to be cheaper. More importantly, there's just no need to do it that way. The consequences yeah. don't merit it. So, so I think that uh, from us in the industry side, at least in my company, um, we, we have tried to, you know, where we have best practices between our, our, our two shipyards, we will share them. Yeah. Uh, but we also do a filter of, is this a, is this a best practice because of the consequence? Is it a best practice because of the risk algorithm? Or is it just a common sense best practice? And, you know, sometimes we, I mean, you'll see stuff going on in the two shipyards that's identical. You'll still see us doing the same thing in both shipyards, but doing it two different ways. And that'll be because of this risk. I've concept. seen that. Yeah, I've seen that. That's a good point. I remember uh, I learned that as, uh, when I was at another shipyard, not yours, one of yours. And uh, we had some uh, half inch steel uh, angle irons coming together, and there was a clearance problem. And I'm talking to the, the ship superintendent. He goes, Yeah, well, we're, we're going to tuck that up. Yeah. 1700 he says yeah we're going to tuck it up i walk back in at eight o'clock in the morning and it's tucked up <laughs> right <laughs> i mean yeah. it was an all-nighter with a couple of uh, oxyacetylene torches and an engineer uh, okay good and uh, and we got the clearances we were looking for so uh, you're right that would not happen in in other communities so uh, that's, that's an excellent point i, I like the way you articulated that <laughs> You know, another piece of that is think about quality, Dave. It just does not to not to belabor it, but yeah. um, you know, there's a diminishing there's a diminishing return on investment in quality. And you can say I'm going to have a zero defect business with no failures. Yeah. Well, some parts of your business you have to be like that. Some parts, of, but but to get to that zero failure, you're going to spend that last one percent is going to cost you an arm and a leg. Yeah, and you true. can actually decide that, you know what, I'm going to settle for 2% failure here yeah. because that's where the knee in the curve is in terms of investment and return. Um, yeah. You know, recognize you got to look at consequence and that sort of thing. The first time I 
actually got my head around that was in Pascagoula uh, when my general manager down there started talking about, you know, we have a, we have a, we had a, at the time, I think we had a four or 5% defect rate. He says, I'm going to move it to two. And I said, why aren't you going to move it to zero? He says, can't afford it. Yeah. If I move it to two, I'm going to save so much money. Um, and I, and that'll say, that'll be more than enough. I need to make up for the 2%. And, and um, uh, it was great insight. Great insight. Yeah, so Todd, anyway. do you want to uh, kick over to questions in the chat? I see some building up. I do, and and actually, it uh, builds on kind of that risk management uh, framework that uh, Mike, you were talking about just a second ago. Uh, Mike Schilling asks, you know, how can the Navy improve contracts with shipbuilding and shipyard maintenance? Uh, and then he broadens that question out a little bit to say, and how is that shipyard infrastructure optimization program? Is that sufficient to modernize um, our facilities? I'll talk about the first one first. Um, you know, I think that if you if you want to kind of start at the beginning of the forest and looking at at ship maintenance and ship repair, let's let's talk about what the real problem we have is. We have a a undefined scope because we have a ship that's going to need to be repaired. We don't even really know what needs to be repaired. We have an undefined scope with a clearly defined budget. That's a real, that's a formula, in, at least on our side of the table, that's a formula for disaster, you know? And that is, that's almost like saying, I'm going to go and invent a way to go to Mars for a thousand dollars. You know, what's it take to go to Mars? Undefined scope, but man, I've got a precisely defined budget for it. What a mess, right? And so let's kind of step back and say, before we define the budget, maybe we should try to define the scope. Now, I, I got to give uh, the Navy some credit because they've been working this problem really hard. Uh, and there's some really good things that are coming out of it. Uh, one of them is uh, this idea that, um, you know, we're going to try to do the same kinds of jobs in the same places. So you do, I mean, learning curve is a real thing. You know, it's not just an academic thing that you read about in business school. It's, it is a real thing. When people are doing what they do and then they get a chance to do it again, they will do it better uh, if, they, if, it, if the time frame is such that they don't forget. Um, so finding ways to take advantage of learning curve is a, is a key principle here. Learning curve in ship repair is a real thing. Um, the second part of it is let's do scope definition. You know, the most complex thing that my company does is the refueling overhauls of the Nimitz class carriers. And if you think about the, the job, it is, a, it is a nuclear refueling. It is a recapitalization of the ship with new technology. And it is a voyage repair after 25 years at sea. So there's three very complicated jobs going on in the same platform at the same time. And yet, you don't ever hear of issues from a budget schedule publicity standpoint around the RCOH. Why is that? Well, for it's not a, it's not a rule, but generally for every day that we have in the availability, we have a day of planning. So we'll start planning a three and a half year availability about three and a half years ahead of time. And we will go to the ship and we will take data to find out if the feed pump really needs to be replaced or not. And, and we will scope the job so that when we get to the point where we're ready to execute the job, we actually have defined the scope. Not perfectly, but reasonably. And, um, and we can, and you know, we, in some places, in some cases, we're able to go and get work started early in these, in these periods of time before the ship arrives. Uh, we'll be we'll be on the ship and we'll be doing either pre-overhaul testing or we will actually be doing early you know early repair. We're trying now to move that model towards uh, the submarine business, um, you know, because submarine repair has been a major challenge for the fleet, uh, and the fleet has started to recognize that there, the volume is such that we need the private sector to be back involved in it again. Now, in my career, we've been in and out of submarine repair three times. 
So from a business standpoint, you got to step back and say, are we really going to be in this business? And is it worth investing my best people into this business if three years from now I'm going to be out of it again? You know, that, that is a real calculation that we will do, that we do on our side of the table. To my, to my way of thinking is the more we can see commitment to the, the scope definition ahead of availability, and the more we see the let's take advantage of the learning curve uh, thing that works, the more we can see that, the more I can say that's a sustainable thing worth investing in. And so I, I would, you know, we can go into all kinds of problems that, that happen in the, on the waterfront. But I, I think that if you start with scope definition and capturing value of learning curves, you know, doing like and similar work in like and similar ways with like and similar people, um, you, you, um, you're, you're on your way. And, and I know it's, I made it sound simple. It makes you wonder why we haven't done that before. Well, there's, there's a whole host of reasons why we haven't done that before that we could talk about. That would be Clausewitz and acquisition. Everything is simple, but the simplest thing is hard. Uh, so what you, I, I mean, what I'm hearing you say is you're looking for stability, you're looking for predictability, uh, you're looking for repeatability in terms of work. Uh, and then that allows you to make business decisions and capital investment decisions that uh, would support that, which benefits the Navy. If, if we do that, if we give you those things, then you give us uh, a better product at a lower cost or a better product at a, at a, at a predictable schedule or at a predicted cost, at least. Does yeah. that, uh, that make sense? I, I, you know, Dave, I do think one, this is one of those areas where data is going to really help us. You know, we, we are going to know um, that the feed pump fails 80% of the time after so yeah. many hours. Yeah. And we're going to say, okay, that's a, we, there, you know, there are organizations that do that now. Yep. And, and I would say that they, they do the best they can with the data that they have, but our ability to collect data and analyze that data is, it is leaping ahead today. Yes. And so I think as we bring that to bear on the repair side of our business, um, you know, our mutual business, I think it's going to have, it's going to have great impact. And I think I have some awareness of uh, commercial ship repair practices, and that's exactly what they do. I mean, uh, it's all about getting the data and understanding the equipment and the uh, thing called a PDF curve and you know, what's the failure modes and how long can you run it and, and that sort of stuff. And if you're on top of that, uh, the things you describe happen exactly. So, uh, so that's uh, that's a good point. And, uh, so, okay, Todd. Admiral Lewis, can you? Uh talk about the continuing resolution, uh, you know, possibilities and, and ask the question that we were going to okay. be talking about. I can't talk about, about it. No, but I would be <laughs> yeah. happy to ask Mike about it. And, uh, you know, he's seeing the impacts uh, real time, a uh, deck plate, if you will, as we say. Uh, so Mike, what do you, uh, there was a hearing yesterday, uh, a lot of discussion in the hearing about the CR potential for a year long CR, a lot of news, uh, here in the last 24 hours or so. Uh, would you mind uh, sharing your thoughts on, on that issue? Well, you know, we, we basically have, uh, as, as a country, um, how, you, how you decide to spend your shared resources, that's kind of like job one. And a CR, a CR of any length, in my opinion, is just a failure at job one. And, I think I, I mentioned, I was talking to a reporter at the Reagan Forum uh, in December, and I, and I made the point that if this were going on in my business, if I had a part of my business where the deadline is September 30th, and we can't ever seem to get it done until January, you know, or December, or maybe later, or maybe never, um, from a business standpoint, we know how to fix that. We create a set of incentives that say, here's you're incentivized to get it done by September 30th, or you're disincentivized to get it done after that, you know? Um, and a funny thing happens when you incentivize behavior is you get it. Yeah. It, you had better be darn sure that that's the behavior you want, that, you know, if you go incentivize something, you better be darn sure that's what you want. But if you incentivize it, you're going to get it. And, and what I see in this process right now, writ large, is that there are no incentives to getting work done on time 
And for, I mean, I thought the CNO did a great job this week explaining just how bad this is for his part of the business. Well, just extrapolate that to every other branch of the, the Pentagon and all the services, and then extrapolate that to the entire national security apparatus. I mean, everybody has got this problem of not being able to get it done on time. Uh, and there's no, there doesn't seem to be any real incentive to get it done on time. We haven't figured out how to do that yet. So um, I think it's a failure to not get it done on time. Uh, and, you know, when this started happening, uh, you know, seen as an exception, now it's become the rule. Uh, and, you know, you, and, and when it becomes the rule, what happens is organizations start planning for it. Yes. Right. So I, I heard a story a long time ago uh, back at the academy about uh, uh, a crew off of Vietnam where they, every time they went to battle stations, um, the, uh, there were no grease pencils because they were still using the, I mean, I remember the grease pencil boards, right? I, I, Dave, I'm afraid you probably do too, right? I do too. I remember yeah, that. So, but there were no grease pencils. And so the quartermaster basically told the XO at one point, XO says, why aren't there any grease pencils here? And he says, because the sailors are thieves and they're stealing them. And the XO said, sailors are not thieves. Why don't you go and you make sure that you put, you go buy all the grease pencils you can buy and put them in stock. And before we, every day, I want you to go put three grease pencils out on, the, on, all, of, on all of the panels. Okay. Well, guess what happened? They ended up bringing back more grease pencils than they took on patrol. <laughs> well, why did that happen? Because the sailors knew if they were going to go to GQ and there wasn't going to be a grease pencil there, if they didn't bring their own grease pencil, <laughs> right, that's exactly right. If they didn't bring their own grease pencil, they wouldn't be able to do their job. So they were, they were organizing themselves around the failure of the quartermaster. Right? Exactly. They were organizing around that. Well, you, you know, what you got going on in the Pentagon now is you got organizations in the, or, in the Pentagon who are sitting there saying, well, you know, okay, here's our budget, but we know we're going to have a three month CR. So we're going to just, we're going to organize our programs around that. We're going to organize that. And, and that is no way to, that's letting the tail of the budget process wag the dog. And that is a, that is just an absolute failure. Um, and it, and it, you know, nobody cares what I think, but I think it needs to be fixed. And I think they could fix it if they really wanted to. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I know uh, having been personally involved in CR uh, planning drills, I can, I can attest to that. <laughs> Todd, back to you. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, another question that came in, uh, based on the earlier discussion of the, uh, you know, reactions to COVID, um, you know, Dewan Miller asked, uh, how did the work from home affect your production, negative, positive, and no change? And, and I would actually broaden that out to, you know, does it open the aperture on global sourcing or at least national sourcing of human talent to meet your needs? Uh, so how does it affect your bottom line in terms of manpower? Yeah, so I, the, I kind of mentioned the first one there already that, uh, you know, I don't necessarily have to have all of my engineers located right outside the gate of the shipyard. I mean, I, they, we got to figure out how you do culture and all of that sort of thing. But I, I mean, I can tell you right now, I've got an HR analyst for my corporation who works from home in Michigan. You know, I mean, it's just and she's really good and we're really happy to have her. Uh, but she doesn't need to be, you know, working, you know, living in Newport News not to come into the office, right? So, um, so our, so the second part of your question is, are we going to, is it going to change the way we think about talent acquisition? Absolutely. It's going to change the way we do that. Um, the first part of your question is kind of an, it's, it's a success story of sorts. Uh, you know, before the pandemic, we may have had about a thousand people or less working remotely. And I would have been one of them. I'd carry my laptop dutifully to wherever I was working and wherever my wherever my tablet or laptop or me, wherever I was, that was my office. I could work mm -hmm. anywhere. Um, within, within about three weeks of the declaration of we've got a problem, uh, we had over 10,000 people working remotely. And if you if you go back and step back and think about this, you know, on in March of 2020, the entire planet got on the internet. <laughs> it didn't break. It didn't break, yeah, right? True. How much resiliency is there in a system where, you know, we, in, in our case, we went from 1,000 to 12,000. We went up by 12 times. I would say we were probably on the, on the lower half of that um, excursion. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, you know, I know companies that just completely stopped coming to the office uh, because the, all of the work they could do, you know, they could do from home. Yeah. In our case, you still got to, you can't build ships in your backyard. You still got to yeah. come to work. And so we got to about 25% at a peak. We had about 25% working remotely. But what it's changed now is it's changed the way we think about talent. It's changed the way we think about office uh, and presence. Um, you know, like today, I'm, I'm working from home today. Uh, some of that is because the Omicron rate is higher in our area than it has been. Some of it is I'm spending the whole day doing this. I don't need to be in my office at work to do this. I can, I can do this from here. Uh, and yet I'm in, I'm in the office often enough so that I get the, the drive-by meetings, the running into people in the, at the water cooler, you know, the, Hey, let's get, let's get, uh, let's get chat over here and let's talk for a few minutes. I mean, we're still doing all of that too. So we're trying to find that happy, that happy mix. Um, but it's absolutely going to change the way that the culture in offices are, and it's going to change the way we think about talent acquisition without a doubt. I think your point is if you can reach out a little bit farther, you don't have to go to a particular place to do a job. And, uh, and if someone doesn't want to leave Michigan right. uh, and they, and they, but they still want to work uh, and, and you can accommodate that by having them work from Michigan while supporting work that's going on in Southern Virginia, uh, Southeast Virginia, then and that's a win for you because you get the best talent and it's a win for them uh, because they have a job they want to do for, for something, doing and, something about it. Yeah. And it helps, it helps politically, Dave, just to, you know, kind of a, the little toe of this is that now you have a shipbuilder in Michigan. Yeah, good point. I thought about that. Right. A, constituent, a constituent voter in Michigan that happens to be a shipbuilder. Yeah. yeah. Good point. One of the things that that uh, brings up for me, uh, Mike, as I'm, you know, listening to your comment, in some ways, there was a group of executives that were already untethered from the office space. And really what COVID did is democratize that to a much larger group uh, within your corporation that were able to do that. So that's, that's a fascinating and, and really different way of thinking about it, that we're actually democratizing work in, in a way uh that that people may not have uh assessed you know we we are coming to the end of our time together uh i was going to leave it to uh vice admiral lewis to ask uh, a last question as we uh begin to do a wrap up and uh again thanks everyone who has been participating in the call today admiral lewis all right well, i'll give you softball then uh where do you see the industry going over the next uh couple of decades frankly shipbuilding defense shipbuilding uh in the united states i mean do you do you see it continuing what's been going on do you see uh perhaps more unity in how the navy approaches it or how the country approaches it uh what do you what are your crystal balls telling you uh, from an industrial uh, perspective. Well, Dave, I, nice little, uh, little punt yeah. over there, second base. <laughs> Thanks. You, you know, you, you've actually looked into my crystal ball and you know that it's as murky as anything else you can look into. Well, maybe where um, would you like it to go? I mean, that's a better look, I, just, uh, <laughs> yeah, well, I think, well, I think there's some general trends that you could, that I think can be, at least from my standpoint, they influence the way I think about the business. Um, I think the first trend is that, the, you know, the Navy of the future, and when I say of the Navy of the future, I, I don't, I'm going to say you can pick any time frame, 5, 10, 20, 25 years, um, the Navy of the future is going to be moving towards a Navy that is um, many, not few, smaller, not large, faster, not slow, cheaper, not expensive. I think you're going to just see that kind of migration in programs and platforms and security, um, you know, kind of a, a many smaller, faster, cheaper Navy. That's going to be a trend. I can't tell you how fast it's going to go. Um, you know, and, and we have to go at a pace where the industry will be in step with that, because if it gets out of sync, you will not only ruin the future, but you'll ruin the present too. So you, you got to kind of walk your way through that, but that's going to be, that's kind of like an undercurrent of where I think the Navy's going. 
I think where the industry is going, and again, I'm not going to try to put a time frame on it, but I, you know, I'm an old physics guy, old. Uh, physics is different today than it was when I actually studied it. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not even sure I can spell it correctly anymore, but when we were in, in physics, we would always think about boundary conditions. And, and I do this a lot with, with, uh, with problems that we have in the business. I'll say, what's the boundary? What are the boundary conditions? Let's, you know, here's, here's the worst it can be if we do this. This is the best it can be. Now, how do, we, how, do we, how do we manage that? If we understand what's happening at the boundary conditions, then we can start to make policy decisions that are going to give us an outcome that we can, we can live with or want or optimize. Um, I think that from the where's the future of the industry going, I think a boundary condition, which is probably one of those, you know, those, what do they call it, Absom asymptotic kind of yeah. boundaries. Yeah. Uh, I think you, you're already seeing us move down the path of unmanned ships, but suppose the, suppose the axis is really unmanned ships in unmanned shipyards, right? And yeah. if you think about what's happening with that, you know, a little bit of what we talked about now, I can do work from just about anywhere. I don't, I, I mean, there's some work that I have to be on, on site for, but I'll, there's some work I don't have to be on site for anymore. And so that's, that can start to demand the shipyards a little bit. Um, you know, the ship, the unmanned, you guys, you guys know we've made big investments in the unmanned future of the Navy yeah. and, and we plan to do more of that because I just believe that's part of the many smaller, faster, cheaper kind of thing. Um, but, you know, an unmanned shipyard, that's kind of, you're talking about robotics, you're talking about additive manufacturing, augmented reality, yeah. uh, training departments are a lot slower because the time to talent is a lot faster. Uh, you know, the, there, there's a, now, are they going to be unmanned shipyards in 2050? I'm not telling you that, but I'm going to tell you that the trend is going to be to find ways to do more, more highly complicated, complex work with fewer fingers. And imagine, imagine as a thought experiment, what it would take to build a ship without touching, yeah. you know? So that's kind of, the, those are the two big trends that I see, Dave. And, and uh, fortunately, I don't have to make a wager on when, I can just kind of invest in the path. Well, I would say, again, back to my experience at DCMA, I spent a lot of time with uh, what you would call second and third tier suppliers. And that is the trend I saw, uh, the, the, uh, See company, there's there are machines out there where you literally throw a chunk of titanium in one end, and three days later, a bunch of parts come out the other end, and they're all perfect. And there are no other than throwing the part in the in the uh, in the or the piece of metal in the beginning and changing uh, bits or putting a bucket of bits in the uh, in the side of the machine when it asks for it. Uh, that's happening, and that's at the supplier level because uh, they can't afford uh, to the workforce, frankly. And uh, so you're, you're, I'm seeing, you know, uh, rooms full of lathes and uh, and uh, and CNC machines being replaced by one ginormous machine. And uh, and machinists are people that are doing this, not people that are doing this. Right. And, We're back uh, to first first and second quartile high school graduates or associate degree people or even back or even college graduates, right? Yep. Um, and it, it doesn't really change the employment level. We you kind of end up with the same levels of employment. They're just doing different work. They're doing different. So the challenge of the big machine is setting up the process, right. improving the process, so that now it's repeatable. It's 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 hard to get that first part through, but after that, make a hundred of them. Sure, choo, choo, yeah. choo, choo, right. choo, boom, boom, boom. So that's a good point, uh, and I agree with you on the navy. Uh, the navy side, we are heading in that direction. It might be uh, a little bit of a sinusoidal path, but. Uh, uh, <laughs> And I like your boundary conditions. What happens at zero? What happens at infinity? That's a superb way. I do the same thing. So, uh, so, so thank you, Mike, for your time. Uh, it's been really good. Uh, I've learned a lot of stuff uh, from this conversation. So I very much appreciate your insight. And, uh, and, uh, and I really do appreciate what you're doing for the country, you and your company, in terms of the products you build. So thank you very much. Well, thank you, Dave. Thank you for all the, I mean, for all the years you and I kind of worked together, uh, you know, one way or another. Um, but, uh, you know, for all that, that was, that was, uh, that was the Lord's work too. So, um, you know, this is all really important stuff and, and look, if we don't care about this, who will? And, and so I, I appreciate and, and really, uh, am honored that you all would invite me to speak to the group. 
And, uh, and my parting message to the group is, uh, you know, make sure you make sure you take care of everything every day because uh, we, we've got big challenges in front of us. And so be the, be the best that you can be and make the people around you as good as they can be. So thanks everybody. It's great to be with you again. Mike, uh, thank you so much uh, for being on with us, uh, Admiral Lewis. Thank you for moderating uh, an incredible discussion. It really was a privilege to have the Naval Postgraduate School Foundation and Alumni Association uh, host this iteration of it. Uh, and we look forward to partnering uh, with both of you on future uh, opportunities to bring this group together. Uh, and I will say a personal word that I'm hopeful that uh, in June, uh, when we get you out here, Mike, we can do some of this hopefully in person uh, with a group of students uh, not having to physically distance, but actually get involved in a little bit uh, more depth of conversation. So thank you again. Uh, this is our pleasure as the Naval Postgraduate School Foundation. And with that, have a great day.